Well, it is great to see you this morning, and um, this is a transition time where our little guys and gals get to go uh, in a setting and context where they can learn and grow, and uh, we're going to learn and grow in here. And it sounds to me like this morning you've had a lot of opportunities already presented for you to grow, uh, whether it's through serving, through ministries such as Bill and Bill shared with us, uh, or perhaps participating in a discussion group on a Sunday morning, um, or uh, perhaps serving in some other way, you have an opportunity to grow in your faith, and that's what it's all about. I think the local church should be these robust, uh, growing communities uh, where good things can happen. And also, um, you've heard uh, Dana talk a little bit about just a vision for uh, our church and our church down the road. I think it's a valid thing for us to think about. And I've kind of mentioned some of that, and I really appreciate the updated figures. I know a few weeks ago when I was trying to pull that uh, figure, uh, it went from 700 some thousand to $518,000 that we owe. And so praise God, it's $200,000 less. Isn't that good? All in the span of two weeks. So God, God is good. So uh, thank you, Dana, so much. You just uh, did a great job as well. Uh, there's a whole lot of love in my heart for each of you today. I think if people really understood how much I love them in the love of Jesus, I'd have people all around me, including gay people, all around me all the time. I think they would. It's like, man, that guy really loves me, doesn't he? Yeah, I do. I really do. And whatever you've done, wherever you've been, whatever your past, we have a new beginning in Jesus. I'll do my best to not just be a, another person in your life that says, yeah, it's all okay. I'll do my best to be a fork in the road. Here's the truth. Here's a God that loves us. Here's a design that's been revealed to us. Now, come on. Let's look at it fairly and honestly. And let's make some decisions that will honor our Creator. Amen? Let's do that. And that's the kind of love I think Jesus presented. He loved people. He, he touched the lepers, but He just didn't leave them that way. He invited them to a life of wholeness. Uh, he spent time with prostitutes and tax collectors, but he didn't give them little talks on here's how you can swindle people with more money or here's how you can do, be a better prostitute. No, he invited them in love to say, wait a second, let's rethink this. Amen? Let's rethink it. That's what love does. I've been asking the uh, key question, is this love? And uh, we're going to hopefully have an um, uh, opportunity to uh, kind of answer that question once again here today. Uh, we're talking about a family you've always wanted and um, one of the things we, we've got to get right in order to have a family we've always wanted we have to understand marriage and until we understand marriage it's going to be tough to have a family we've always wanted and really what the purposes are for marriage and I've given to you these six purposes of marriage uh, and there's nothing that says I've got to do them in the order that I've listed, to, uh, listed them for you, whether it's in the Uversion app or whether it's been on a slide. And so we'll probably be looking at one of the purposes of marriage today. Uh, and to, in order for us to get there, though, and kind of set the context for this, I think it's important uh, that we look at the parameters of marriage that's set out for us in a pre-fall passage of Genesis chapter 2. And on the slide, slide number three, uh, we read that that is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. And uh, so, uh, what does Moses say is a correct definition of marriage? What does Moses say and give to us as the purposes of marriage? He very clearly articulates that. Well, what what does Jesus say? Well, Jesus, uh, several... A hundred years later, or maybe a couple millennia later, uh, he says in Mark 10, but at the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. Uh, they come in, uh, human, humanity comes in two models, two versions, male and female. Uh, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they are, so they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. What does Jesus say? is the definition of marriage. Very clearly. He agrees with Moses. What does Paul... Paul, if I could call you to the witness stand, what do you say is the definition of marriage? We can call Moses. Well, he's got it clear. We can call Jesus. Right on the money with Moses. Paul, what do you say? Exact same thing. Marriage is a union of a man and a woman. To each other. 
for the purpose of raising children, whether they're biological or adopted, for the purpose of raising children. Any other arrangement contradicts the basic definition of marriage. I like how Ryan Anderson uh, tells it and shares this uh, regarding this idea of defining marriage and the purposes of marriage. If we look on slide number 15, slide 15, you're going to see that marriage, according to Anderson, is based on the truth that men and women are complementary. The biological fact that reproduction depends on a man and a woman. And the reality that children need a mother and a father. Marriage is based on the truth that men and women are complementary. The biological fact that reproduction depends on a man and a woman. Three, and the reality. Truth, fact, reality that children need a mother and a father and everything we read everything we analyze everything we we uh, that we have researched we meaning the academic community the psychological community the spiritual community the pastoral community everybody's going to tell you mothers and fathers are essential in a family they're not interchangeable the, the, the genders are not equivalent. There are differences in the gender and it's a God-designed difference. We were created with deficits, God-designed deficits in who we are as male and female. And it takes male and female together to comprise the Imago Dei, the image of God. It takes both. We are complementary in that way. Uh, I uh, am always reading and... and uh, studying and trying to articulate and put words to my thoughts and I came across uh, something in one of the resources I was consulting for this message here this weekend and then in the upcoming weekends and I just I came across this too late to actually include it in my notes but I just snapped a picture of it in my book and uh, and the uh, the author is N.T. Wright and he makes such a valid point uh, when he talks about Genesis, the Genesis 1 and 2 passages. And he says, to think about the complementary nature of creation itself. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Heavens and earth, you see. And, and so not only that, but within the cosmic pairing, we find other quote-unquote couples in the Genesis passages. The sun and moon. Morning and evening. Day and night. The sea and dry land. Plants and animals. And finally the apex of creation. Man and wife. It's not sun and sun. It's not moon and moon. It's not plants and plants. No, the cosmic coupling, the creationary design, the pattern, very clearly. And I don't know why we just can't take truth for what it says so very clearly. The cosmic coupling, the, 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 the natural design and natural revelation of God, it's so very, very clear that obviously we are meant to couple things together and the apex of the coupling is man and woman there's no other way any other design any other uh, notion or or proposition contrary to this basic pattern this cosmic coupling we see from the very beginning is contrary to what god's vision and dream and plan for our lives are and so we see it here uh in this in these texts what does Moses say? What does God say, first of all? That's most important. What does Moses say? What does Jesus say? What does Paul say? What has the church said for 2,000 years? What has all of society said for the last 4,000 years? What have we said? One man, one woman, together for life. With very few exceptions, 
uh, of divorce allowed. And the Bible talks about those exception clauses. But the will of God, the plan of God, one man, one woman, together for life, in a commitment that will ensure the welfare of any children they produce and or adopt into their family unit. That's marriage. And so we see monogamy in these great witnesses that we could call to the witness stand uh, that's much higher and much greater than any Supreme Court might ever think they are. The witness stand of heaven and God and these inspired witnesses and those who are called to the stand of biblical truth and they're called to this dock and they're put in the dock and they have to proclaim what is it that they know about life, about humanity, about, about God, about family, about children, about male and female and marriage and all of these things. And they are unified. Don't go to some remote Leviticus passage and try to make God into something he's not. Don't do that. God is love. And he's trying to show you how life is designed to work. Let's not try to get new and creative in how we interpret biblical truth. What's Matthew Vines thinking these days? Trying to come up with new interpretations of these classic passages, six classic passages, both the Old and New Testaments. Passages that that very clearly negatively speak of any exception, any of these outlying definitions we have of what marriage and family is supposed to be. These these outliers who suggest these kind of off-the-wall ideas. Okay? And we've got people like that today. and, And so therefore, it has become imperative. It has become absolutely essential that churches just like this with nothing to hide, nothing really that much to lose. Okay? We're here. It's become our our calling, our vision to address the outlying theories and proposals made by those on the fringes of what really family's supposed to be. Now listen, monogamy, sexual exclusivity, permanence, these are all key words as we endeavor to take back the discussion on what it really means to be family. The church hasn't done a very good job of articulating that discussion. We've not done a very good job, perhaps, of modeling this discussion. Living out the creative ideal and the cosmological couplings of God, even in the book of Genesis. Man and woman together, loving each other, growing intimate each day, and becoming soulmates and serving in a chaotic, fallen creation. Not as, not as distant uh, strangers, but as intimate allies in the struggle for the beauty of the world and the calling that God has called us to as man and wife. You see, we got to take it back. We have to take it back. We've got to take back the discussion. We've got to articulate the biblical view. Otherwise, we stand to lose so much. And so marriage is the union of man and woman to each other for the purpose of raising children or uh, however they come into that family. And any other basic definition, outlying definitions contrary to that are not, uh, in the truest sense of the word, uh, truly marriage. So marriage exists to bring a man and a woman together as husband and wife, to be father and mother to any children the union produces or that are, or that are adopted. And I think we've got to articulate that, and I think I've made that clear here this morning. I want to give us, and all of us, uh, I want to give some time to looking at closely the purposes of marriage. And I think when we understand the purposes of marriage, what what we will have are answers to the questions raised by the outliers, those who want to challenge the definition of of marriage and family. And when we look at the purposes of marriage, we'll have answers by virtue and by extension of those those purposes. And so... uh, these are not unrealistic expectations of marriage. You know, these are the main reasons, these purposes of marriage are the main reasons why we get married. And part of the problem, I think, is no one knows the basics of marriage anymore. And so anytime we humans think that we can come up with a better way of doing things other than God's design way, His cosmic coupling plan, Anytime we humans think we get, we're smarter than God, we lose our way, we get lost in a quagmire of depravity, we're broken, we're confused, and it's everybody's issue. It's not just one group. It's, it's all of us, okay? But marriage is God's idea, but because 
the people who get married are sinners like we are, we know that marriage will not solve all of our problems. It will not. A lot of people think that marriage creates problems. Well, marriage doesn't create problems. Marriage reveals problems. If you are bitter and angry, your marriage will reveal it. If you are undisciplined and lazy, your marriage will reveal it. If you are pouty and sulky and self-righteous, your marriage will reveal it. It doesn't create the problems. It just reveals what's there in your life. And that's just the way marriage works. And so marriage has a God design to it. And it's far more important than perhaps we realize. Now I want to offer a paradigm shift. And, I, and the paradigm shift, uh, not so much a scientific definition, but a paradigm shift is just a different way of looking at something. And maybe it's a, it's, a, it's a different way of looking at something in such a way that it radically changes how we view marriage. And so I want to offer a paradigm shift. And it doesn't come from me, but it comes from someone who I had an email conversation with someone and they kind of made some comments and I kind of followed up on some of those comments and I'm really buying in. Uh, slide, slide number four, if you would, on the screen. I'm buying in to what... Uh, Gary Thomas proposes in his book, Sacred Marriage. And he asks this question. What if God designed marriage to make us holy more than to make us happy? Wow. Would that change the debate? What if I had horrible male-female experiences as a child? What if that whole other gender world is so intimidating to me that I just, I I just, I don't think I could ever be happy with a person of the opposite sex. It's all so big and intimidating for me. I'm just going to settle for same gender relationship. And learn to transfer all the heterosexual, normal heterosexual desires and, and, and vision and goals. I'm just going to channel that in the same sex direction because it's much easier based on my past. But what if working through the issues of the past? What if working through the differences of a gender, another gender, an opposite gender? What if all of that was part of God's plan? Not just to make you happy, but to make you holy. He says, your marriage is more than a sacred covenant with another person. It is a spiritual discipline designed to help you know God better, trust Him more fully, and love Him more deeply. And I say, Amen, Gary Thomas. He's got it. I'm a fan. And I think he's on to something. Listen, marriage as spiritual discipline. What a radical thought. Have you ever thought about marriage that way? Now, this comes as a shock to us romantically inclined Americans. You know, how many movies, how many stories, how many personal testimonies do you hear where we hear the people say, well, I just looked at her and I saw a spiritual discipline waiting to happen right I looked at him and oh there's my spiritual growth tool right how many times do you see that in a love letter or underneath the pillow or on Valentine's Day not very often do we no because we don't think of it in that way and that's why I say paradigm shift this is radical this changes everything if we see marriage as spiritual discipline. What is a spiritual discipline? Uh, I go to Henry Nouwen, who writes that a spiritual discipline is simply, and you might want to note this, creating some space in our lives in which God can act. Isn't that good? Spiritual discipline, what is it? It's creating some space in our lives in which God can act. So discipline means to prevent everything in your life from being filled up. We create this space where God can move in my life 
and I lean into these certain activities, behaviors, ways of thinking. I lean into these things in such a way that it creates room for God to speak to me, shape me, mold me, challenge me, knock me down, stand me back up, reformulate my life, build, rebuild the interior chaotic, messed up interior part of my life. This is what we do when we lean into spiritual disciplines. And in the spiritual life, discipline means to create that space in which something can happen that you hadn't planned or counted on. That's what it is. So when we create space for God to act, when we do or when we participate in these activities, spiritual growth can happen. And you may not think you can love someone of the opposite sex, but you can if you'll lean into the spiritual disciplines. God will reshape you. Okay? And you may now think, well, I, you know, that may be their problem. I can't love someone of the opposite, uh, of, of, uh, of the opposite sex either. Heterosexual interests and desires. I don't know if I can love them. You know? Well, you can. Some of you are like, well, I don't know if I can love the person I'm presently married to right now. You can. You can. Because you see... They're more than, marriage is more than just to make you happy, it's to make you holy. And so, what are some of the spiritual disciplines in our new marital paradigm shift? Well, Richard Foster talks about the disciplines of meditation, the disciplines of prayer, journaling, where we just sit down, we begin to write out our thoughts on a regular basis. Fasting is a spiritual discipline. We study that's a discipline. We uh, simplify life. That's a discipline. Frugal living is a discipline where we hike lighter than we have in the past. Solitude is a discipline where we just get quiet and let the Lord speak. Uh, maybe we take a hike or some, some one of our favorite places. If you're fortunate enough to uh, be in a, a, a serene place, maybe you just go in the backyard and just have some, your moment there on the uh, with your favorite drink and, and uh, on your patio or deck. Uh, submission is a spiritual discipline. That's a big one. Learning to submit to authority structures in your life, especially the authority structure of God. Service is a discipline. We heard a little bit about that today. Corporate confession and worship, that's a discipline coming to church every week so your priorities can be addressed. You know, Mother Teresa even saw serving the poor as a discipline or a sacrament. It's an act of worship. She saw it just like communion or baptism. When you take time to serve poor people, she says you encounter Jesus in ways you don't know, you wouldn't otherwise. She saw serving the poor as a spiritual discipline. So these are ways that you can participate in your own transformation. And so when someone asks you, why do you read the Bible? When someone asks you, why do you take these long meditation walks? When someone asks you, why do you go to church with others all the time, every weekend? Why do you aspire to live a simple life? Why do you offer so many volunteer hours there? Why do you go periods of time without food in your life? Why do you write in that notebook all the time and journal all the time? And why do you want to get married? Why do you, why do you want to stay married? Why do you want to get remarried? Why do you want to marry someone of the opposite gender? Here's all you need to say. I'm creating some space in my life in which God can act. And they'll be like, man, that guy is deep. That woman is deep. Mysterious. Woo. I've never heard of that before. You, you do say it again. What are you doing? Listen, I'm creating space in my life for God to act. That's what I'm doing. And so when Gary Thomas says marriage is a spiritual discipline, okay? He's asking you to see it not as just something that's meant to make me happy. It's meant to make me holy. What does it mean to be holy? Am I self-righteous? Do I come across as, you know, straight as arrow Joey? Okay. Never bending the rules Joey? 
I don't know, that's not true. All right? Is that, how, is that what holiness is? No, no. Come on now. Holy, don't think in sanctimonious religious terms. Holiness, being holy, is simply being set apart so that your life functions the way it's meant to. That's all it is. That's all it is. Your body is served the purposes of God like it's meant to serve. You put one female uh, part of anatomy with a male anatomy, see? Okay? It, the parts fit. All right? You're using that which God has given in a way he's designed you to use it. That's all holiness is. So I'll use my time to honor God like I'm supposed to. I'll use my body. I'll use my mind. I'll use every part of my life in a way that God wants me to use it. And therefore, I will be set apart. I will be holy in that sense. And God will use these kinds, of, this, these kinds of priorities in my life to shape the interior part of me so that if I'm not loving someone of the opposite gender but I want, and I'm tending to be oriented toward a person of the same gender, I'm giving God room to act to begin to work in my life to transform the what I feel, what I see, what I think at a deep theological, psychological, emotional, personal level. And that's where we come in. Because if marriage is spiritual discipline, it belongs in the church and lived out outside of the church. And if marriage is a journey, and it's a journey that moves us away from self toward Christ in a greater way, toward holiness in a greater way, then we got to champion it and we got to make room right here in these seats for God to act whatever your orientation or gender okay whatever your sin or addiction whatever your hang up hurt failure foible or whatever fumbles whatever that is there's a seat for you there's a place for you to create some room for God to act now what about it are you creating space for God to act in your life this morning uh this will revolutionize how you view your spouse. And I offer it uh, this, this morning as probably one of the soundest lines of, of argument and, and uh, that which we, when we propose a different kind of life, when we pro propose a definition of marriage that is right, that is truth-based, that is God-honoring, I think we have to end that discussion talk about marriage as spiritual discipline and Thomas does it so well now in light of these things I think what I'm going to do is I want to transition to purpose number four so there's nothing that says I got to do these in order okay so I'm going to go to purpose number four there's like six purposes for marriage I'm going to go to purpose number four. I got 1113 on my clock. I see it. Rest easy. Okay? And so I'm going to just give this a good, good, solid focus here. Give me just maybe five, ten minutes here to try to nail this. At least this, well, maybe mm, 12 minutes. <laughs> 12 minutes might be more helpful to me. Okay? And then we'll get you out of here. Okay? But we're going to get this started today. And that is... What is the purposes of marriage? We've got six of them. One of the purposes of marriage, God created marriage for the maturing of our character. That's why he made it. Because an unmarried you, now God's gifted people for singleness, and that's awesome. Paul had that gift, and he was single, and God did some awesome stuff in him, and, and, and God, he also suffered a lot. And I think anything he lost and missed in marriage he probably made up for and all the suffering he did and God shaped him through all, a lot of those things but God created marriage for the maturing of your character and my character I guarantee you there's people here today that will tell you I would hate to think what I would be if I never got married and had children how my life would be different and think about that I know my life would be different there's no way I'd be the same and, and different in a good way. Uh, but the Lord God said, it's not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Again, like two pieces of a puzzle that go together. And the man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. This is now 
or at last, or finally, this is what I've been looking for all of my life. And how long was all of his life? We don't know. Could be a lot longer than you think. But finally, bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, she shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. Listen, guys, bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh, that's weird. What is that? It's a poetic way of saying, as I see you, I now know who I am. I have found myself in you. In other words, you're not God, but I see a reflection. As I see you, I'm not just coming to another. I'm coming to someone who is helping me to see who I am. I need femininity to understand masculinity. I need masculinity to understand femininity. And by discovering you, I have found out who I am. I see myself in you. You see me. And in fact, you see things in me that only you can see. Bone of my bones flesh of my flesh all right and the moment you marry and or have children or adopt children you begin to change in profound ways guys until you get married to a person the opposite gender you are really self-centered marriage will teach you it's not all about you and if life is a laboratory of learning how to love marriage is your primary place of experimentation And once you get married, you have to learn to think about somebody else. And we're not used to that. You see, into your life comes a person of a different gender, a person with mysteriously profound differences that are really almost impossible to define. It's a very radically different view of you that you're going to get. It's a radically different view of the world that you're going to get. It's a radically different view, but there's equal resources in the male and female there's there's equal abilities there's incredibly uh things are incredibly different though and they're cast in a different light because the essence of femaleness and maleness is i think pretty obvious to all of us Uh, one is very relationship oriented and the other the male is so many times task oriented and god understands this in complementarity when he puts us together because we make a great team And as soon as you get married, though, within a year or two, you're going to begin to see how selfish you really are. If you're not married, just trust me. All right? You're going to see it. And you'll see more and more how how maybe you'll even look at your spouse and think, well, man, they're kind of selfish. And your spouse will look at you and they'll think, well, man, they're really more selfish than I am. And so you'll have this little kind of debate going on in your mind and your heart. And and you'll, you'll begin to think about how selfish both of you really are. Maybe more about how your spouse is more selfish than you and you start believing that they are but after you live together for a while and maybe even several years pass you actually begin to think about the other person's perspective more if you view marriage as a discipline if marriage is a spiritual discipline where you create room for God to act you start paying more attention to the husband or the wife that God has brought into your life They become these tools that God, in fact, does use to shape your character and to mature you. And uh, and what really is great is when you turn a corner in your marriage where you realize that, you know what, her concerns, in my case, her concerns are more important than me. My selfishness is far worse than hers, far worse. And you begin to look at that, and you begin to think about that, and you begin to more preoccupied with your selfishness and how much damage you've inflicted on the relationship rather than trying to point out how someone else has maybe hurt you. Marriage forces you to look in the mirror. Marriage gets you by the scruff of the neck. It pushes your face in the mirror and says, look at you, old buddy. Look at you, young lady. That's what marriage does. It makes you look at yourself. And it's designed to bring you into confrontation, not so much with your spouse. It's a confrontation with you, you yourself. And it shows you your character flaws. It shows you what's wrong with you. It shows you ways to change that otherwise you would never find. And what are the, fla- what are the flaws that your spouse 
that they're going to see. Well, you may be a fearful person with a tendency to great anxiety. Marriage will reveal that. You may be a proud person with a tendency to be selfish. Your marriage will reveal it. You may be an inflexible person with a tendency to be demanding. You may be an undisciplined person with a tendency to be unreliable. You may be a perfectionistic person with a tendency to be very critical of other people. You may be an impatient, irritable person with a tendency to hold grudges. You may be a cowardly person with a tendency to twist the truth to look good. Your parents have seen it. Your siblings have seen it. Your friends have seen it. Your roommates have seen it. They might have even tried to talk to you about it in college. Maybe your mom and dad tried to approach the subject with you and you kind of know about it, but not really because you just brushed them off. Oh, they don't get me. They don't understand me. They don't see me clearly. They don't really know who I am. And you kind of know about it, but you kind of don't. Or at least you pretend you don't. Marriage, though, is one of those God calling those spiritual discipline activities that you engage in, that you enter into, and it doesn't let you off the hook so easily. It forces you to look at your flaws and your character issues. And that's why we all have to come into this thing humbly. Okay? And the next thing you're going to find out as you get married and you walk in this way of marriage and the spiritual discipline of marriage... You're going to ask yourself, why am I having all these confrontations? And you're going to think, it's my spouse. She's the problem. It's my husband. She, he's the problem. No, they're not. It's marriage. It's marriage. And you're being asked to be shaped in ways that you've never been shaped before. And yeah, they may have issues, okay? They may have issues. But primarily, if we look at marriage as a spiritual discipline, God making you holy more than make you happy... What, whoever your spouse is, whatever they are, whether they're a believer or not, Christian or not, they're agents used by God to shape you in ways you'd never be shaped otherwise. Okay? Now, that doesn't mean you put up with abuse and things like that. Don't misunderstand. I'm just saying, when you got God at work in your life, and marriage is, in fact, a spiritual discipline used by God to make you holy more than make you happy, nothing is beyond the parameters of what He can do and use in your life. To shape you in ways you never would be otherwise. And so if you don't go into marriage with the expectation that marriage is a spiritual discipline more than anything else. Yes, it's romance. Yes, it's love notes. Yes, it's all those things. But when push comes to shove and you're in year 10 or year 15 or year 27. And you're trying to figure out how you got so messed up. All right. Well, when we, when we don't view, go into marriage with the expectation that it's something other than a spiritual discipline, other than a journey, we're going to make shipwreck of it. We're going to struggle because I thought marriage was supposed to make me happy. Well, you can grow in Christ. You can grow in your character. And God uses marriage to do it many times. Now listen, I'm out of time. And so... Let me share with you a thought, maybe a couple thoughts, a short story. We'll wrap it up for today. Um, there's Philip C. Brewer is a guy that wrote a piece called The Paradoxes of a Man of God. And I really appreciate just the thoughts, uh, kind of like the paradoxes that he kind of compares in this little piece that he's written. And I guess... I don't know that he wrote it uh, to indicate what marriage had meant in his life and how God used marriage as a spiritual discipline in his life. But definitely the content of this piece has really, it puts words to how I feel about marriage. Because this is what's happened in my life. Listen to what Philip C. Brewer says. Paradoxes of a man of God. Or a woman of God. All right? Strong enough to be weak. Successful enough to fail. Busy enough to take time. Wise enough to say I don't know. Serious enough to laugh. Rich enough to be poor. Right enough to say I'm wrong. Compassionate enough to discipline. Conservative enough to give freely. Mature enough to be childlike. Righteous enough to be a sinner. 
important enough to be last, courageous enough to fear God, planned enough to be spontaneous, controlled enough to be flexible, free enough to endure captivity, knowledgeable enough to ask questions, loving enough to be angry, great enough to be anonymous, responsible enough to play, assured enough to be rejected, stable enough to cry, victorious enough to lose, industrious enough to relax, leading enough to serve. Marriage has been very, very good to me. Amen? It's taught me some things. I just wouldn't be the guy you're seeing today without the beautiful, wonderful woman that God's brought into my life. And you know what? I've, I'm not, I, I want to get to this place and I know, I bet you do too. Where in light of marriage as a spiritual discipline, I bet you want to get to the place in your life, like me, where I can say, you know, honey, I see something glorious God is doing in your life. And I believe I am both attracted and called to enable that process to the best of my ability. And to work with Jesus in the process. And that's where I want to go in, in our marriage. That's what I want to do. I think in our heart of hearts, that's how we feel. But it doesn't come out that way sometimes. And we struggle sometimes. But it's very different, you see, than this marriage that makes me happy and marriage that makes me holy, you see. And so we don't just look at a person as they are when we're married with this paradigm shift in mind. You look at a person as they're going to be. You don't say, here's how you can be useful to me. No, no. You come and you say, I find in myself a passion to make myself useful to you, to the one who is working in your life. That's marriage. as a spiritual discipline. And I want to get there so much and live from that so much and avoid these uh, little periods of selfishness and meism and all the things that we kind of go through when we're in our marriage relationships well marriage is a wonderful thing and I just want you to know it this morning and so if you're not married it's worthy to pursue it if you are married it's worth sticking with it and leaning into it as a spiritual discipline rather than looking for the quick way out okay and then if you're struggling with a person of the same gender okay I'm just going to tell you that when you, when you begin to view marriage as a spiritual discipline, all of a sudden the, the logic of getting to know someone of the opposite gender is just too much for me. It's just beyond what I can do. That doesn't hold water anymore. Now it's like, okay, if God's meaning for marriage to make me holy, why am I trying to same it up with someone of the, that's just going to mirror who I am? They're not going to challenge me into anything different. The mysteriousness of femininity. It's just no, maleness with maleness. It's just a picture of me. There's no challenge in that. There's no true love in that. Okay? So we've got to rethink it. You see, this paradigm shift changes the debate entirely. And it changes our approach. Whether we're heterosexual or homosexually inclined, it changes the approach of both. And you begin to, you begin to see marriage for what it really is. I'll close with this. Ashley Cleveland, a songwriter and a singer. And she entitled her book, Little Black Sheep. And I've shared her story with you. But what I didn't share when I used her story and how, and she has so struggled in her life, but she articulates it very well, how Christ really met her and changed her and transformed her through a lot of different spiritual disciplines and things. But uh, I've shared that story with you, but I didn't share that Ashley talks about her homosexual father in her book, Little Black Sheep. She talks about her father. She says he was brilliant. He was a complicated man, though. But the product of a southern matriarchal family with a domineering mother and a silent specter of a father. He was handsome, she says of her father. He was accomplished, he was charming, and he was gay. He was not looking for intimacy with my mother, she writes. He was a man who viewed women as accessories or lapel pins, connected only at the surface, but meant only for display. He reserved the most honest, accessible part of himself for a secret male world fueled by good gin, glamour, gossip, and luxury fabrics 
These were the things that mattered most. And he was in the fabric trade and industry. Although he was impeccably, impeccably mannered, he tended to the smallest social obligation to the T. The emotional truth that creates intimacy with other people, including me as his daughter, was nowhere to be found. This made him distant and ultimately unknowable. I could never know who he was. Cleveland's parents divorced, and she wrote, I don't remember when it dawned on me that he was homosexual. My awareness grew slowly, a distinct lack, she says. It was a distinct lack of female presence in his life. We were unwittingly submerged in the secrecy of his life that ultimately was a secret only to himself. You know that two before thing last week? Okay? All these tweezy, he tweezered out, he tweezered out social obligations. Boy, he wouldn't be late for anything. He tweezered out uh, styles and making sure he looked great, fashion. He tweezered out drinks that were so precise and tasty and good. And all the while, he had this big tuba for He was leveling the people in his family. And he refused to see it. Well, Ashley had to write a sociology paper for college. And so she had to go to a gay bar to kind of research that a little bit. And she said, I had a longing to decipher my father's other life because it did not include me. I went to the discos not so that I might run into him, but to somehow have closeness by association. Somehow maybe I could know my dad in a way he wouldn't let me know him yet, knowing him otherwise. You see, Ashley's family, they never view marriage, they never view marriage as a, as a discipline. It was something just to make you happy. Something that was pragmatic. Something that was just practical to keep the surface appearance okay. But in reality, they were just so far removed from the purposes that God had for their life. Listen, we're out of time. We're going to wrap it up right there. Some of you need prayer. I know that you do. I did, I've done some more reading this week. And, and uh, a lot of times, you know, we have a little circle of self. You know, a little circle, we have self, S-E-L-F, self. And then outside of that circle, there's another circle that includes that circle, but it's beyond it. And that is shame. Shame. It is hurt. There are things that have happened to the self that has messed up the self. And it's shame. And there's maybe acts in your life that have happened beyond what you could really control. And maybe you experimented, maybe you made decisions, maybe you've done some things that kind of got a label and you've been trying to shake it, not sure how to shake it. The shame around the self. And then, what's crazy, the author says, there's another circle around that, those two. And that's the circle of a false self. When things get too hot or too close, I'll get funny and distract the attention. I'll be the clown. So nobody knows. Huh? When things get too close, someone gets a little too tight, I'll start talking about my favorite hobby. Because that keeps me away from having to deal with the shame and stuff in my life. So you got self, you got shame, you got a false self. And ultimately what we all do we live from that false self. We create this persona. Everything's okay. Just like our southern gentleman, Ashley Cleveland's father. It's all okay. And he lived performing an act. And he never got to know his daughter. Who desperately wanted to know him. Had to go to gay bars to try to figure him out. There's no life in it. There's no life in it. I stand before the new community and I entreat with the most, the, the, the most uh, vigorous, uh, the most passionate, uh, the most determined uh, entreaty that I can make to you this morning. You have to come to Christ. You've got to get a new identity. You've got to view marriage 
as an act of worship, a spiritual discipline that God has called into your life to change you in ways you never would. Let's play our song. Just sit and listen. Worship before the Lord a few moments. We're going to let you go. I'll be preaching and teaching this week. All week in southern Indiana. Pray for me. I'll be uh, training bivocational pastors. um, Preparing them for ministry in their local churches. Okay. Let's just have a moment of closure here. Play the song. It's a good song. Listen. Let the Lord speak to you. 